we were talking about Jack Flaherty, and yeah. you know, I'm I'm making light of this only because you know, in retrospect, it, it's not all that stunning that he you know had such a hard time of it uh, his first time out, but. He was so overheated in terms of his intensity and emotions. They could have, they could have used an air conditioner out there on the mound because he was. <laughs> even he said he was basically overheated. He was too juiced up. So, what did you think? Yeah, I think so. You know, I mean, you could kind of tell he was talking to the media before the game, uh, the day before, and you could tell he was ready to go. He was champing at the bit. He was, you know, you, you could kind of even feel as he was talking in the. Uh, you know, and he was he was sweating pretty profusely at that point too because he'd just come in from from his workout on the field. Uh, you could tell he was he was ready to go. This wasn't about one start. This was about months of frustration. This was about all the injuries he's had, and I think maybe sometimes as much as you try to uh, to make sure you're not going too hard, it, it's hard to do. You know, because I mean, the, the the stated reason that he was starting is because he felt like he wanted to ramp up the intensity, you know, more so than the pitch count. You know, they wanted to go. 60 pitches in the majors at a higher intensity as opposed to, let's say, 75 in the minors at a lower intensity where you just can't get that major league intensity. So, you know, that was part of it. And, you know, that's what we saw happen. And it's just – it's hard to try to ramp that up and then dial it back because the temperatures are so hot. Uh, uh, our guy Ryan Fagan with us from the Sporting News. I wanted to get your thoughts on one particular aspect of the Cardinals, the impact of – Brendan Donovan, most of all, yeah. but, you know, of course, Juan Yepes, and I think we add uh, Nolan Gorman to that list, even though, you know, his power game has faded for now. He still has an OPS that's north of uh, league average. I mean, so he's yeah. doing some things well, and, and he'll only get better. But what do you, uh, in terms of the hitters, what do you think their impact means? How much deeper is this team because of them? Well, I mean, this is this is why you try to build a system, right? This is why you have guys that can be ready to step in if you need to. And, you know, Donovan especially is the guy, when he came up, you know, I, I told somebody, I forget who it was in the, in the press box, you know, this, is a, this is a guy, if he hits at all, he's going to be next to impossible to send down, right? Because he's that kind of guy that a championship team needs. He's a guy who can play extended days at different positions if the need arises. And if he's going to hit 330 as he's doing it, he's going to play every day, which is what we've seen a lot. You know, instead of filling in for somebody for a week at a position, he's kind of playing here one day, another position the next day. And, and that's what you need. I mean, uh, when you talk about surviving a long season, a 162-game season, especially when you're playing in St. Louis and so many of the games are going to be with a temperature a heat index at 95 to 105, you're going to need depth. And he provides that kind of depth. You know, Yepes is a guy that he has, has some, some pop in that bat. Obviously, you need guys who can come in off the bench and hit home runs, whether it's in a pinch hitting role or in a, um, you know, a spot start here or there or filling in at, at first base when Goldschmidt needs a day at, at DH. So, yeah, I mean, he's, he's a big part of that too. And I think we've seen a lot of guys come up from the minors this year and be asked to contribute and not just in a little way, but they've been asked to contribute in a big way. And, you know, as you sit there and look at the standings, it's clear they're doing at least an adequate job. You know, they're not all hitting 330 like, like Donovan, but, you know, they've come in and they've done their part and they've, they've played the role that the Cardinals have asked of them, and, that, and that's huge. It definitely is. And, I, um, you know, it looks like Carlson's really in a good place. He, he even was before he went on the I.L. with that hamstring. And Tyler O'Neill's definitely swinging better. I mean, I you, the power's going to come. I mean, I think his at bats, the quality of those at bats is better. So we're just waiting on the the, the actual dynamite to, to explode. But they have um, there. Yeah, there's a couple flaws there, but they seem they just. You always hear managers, even when it's not true, they want to believe it's true. So they'll talk about, boy, our lineup's really deep. You know, and, and you're like, what, well, what what team are you managing? I'm not familiar with that team, but. but but I really do believe this is one of the deeper lineups they've had in the while oh, in a while, so that can only help them. So, hey, I wanted to ask you this: we haven't checked in with you for a while, and again, our guest Ryan Fagan, uh, senior baseball writer for the Sporting News. Um, what's your updated assessment of the NL Central and the two-team race between the Brewers and the Cardinals? I mean, that's that's certainly what it is, isn't it? I think more so than any division in baseball, it's 
one of those two teams is going to win. The question is, is, are, is the other one going to be in that wild card conversation? You know, at, at the moment, the Brewers are in the conversation, but they've, you know, they, they've had a rough go of it, right? And I think when right. you look at that team, you wondered how the offense was going to be, right? And early on, they hit a lot of home runs. I mean, I think it was like a month into the season, they were leading the NL in home runs. And it still felt, let's just say it wasn't sold, right? You weren't sold that that was still going to be an offense that was going to keep, continue to produce that way the entire season. And, and they've gone through a rough stretch. There's no doubt about it. I think when you still look at, though, at their their rotation, you know, Cor- Corbin Burns is the real deal. He's going to be a star pitcher the whole time he's in the major leagues as long as he stays healthy. You know, Woodruff had had some, some issues, and then he got injured. You know, I think when you have guys like Eric Lauer contributing, I think that's a big thing for them when they get their number four and five starters to, to be there. But, you know, I mean, look, I don't think the Cardinals are a team that's going to win 95 games, but the Brewers aren't either, right? And so the question is, is who's going to get through there? And, you know, when you look at, you know, because with the Cardinals, it's not just about getting to the postseason. It's can you do something in October? And, you know, I think the Cardinals are positioned to get to October, right? Again, not a 105-win team but they're positioned to get in October because of where they are. And they have the pieces. If everyone's healthy when October rolls around, they have the pieces to do something. So I think, you know, if you're asking, like, where are the Cardinals um, positioned, like where they want to be for the season, I think they're in a pretty good spot. And like we talked about, some of the young guys coming up and showing that they can compete and make an impact at this level, I think that's a big part of that too. Yeah, absolutely. Ryan Fagan with us. I – it's it's one of those things where you want to you know I we all love to play GM and you know I I look at the Cardinals I look at the Brewers I'm starting to think okay what does each team need and you know we won't worry about the Brewers right now but you know you look at the Cardinals you know the Flaherty comeback if he can get to that level where he's good and and you know you can rely on uh, his health and that he'll 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 stay on the mound instead of having a, a you know another injury but you know having having him and then making that a a foundation where you have four, you know, four good starters is a big, big step because, you know, they have, I think they have enough depth within to, for a fifth starter. If Matt's doesn't come back in a long time, you know, whether it's Palante or uh, Zach Thompson or, may, or maybe Libertor, but do you think though, and I'm not going to hold you to it because I wouldn't hold myself to it. Do you think though that Moselak and Gersh, and all the and all of that uh, front office staff. Do you think that looking for a starting pitcher is still something that should be uh, a priority, or at least a need that should not be ignored? I think what they will do is they will kick the tires. Right. I don't think they're motivated to go out and overpay for a starter. They're not going to win a whole lot of bidding wars if we're talking about the top names that have been out there. And to be honest with you, that, that's on the slate for next week is to kind of look at the top pitchers and, and hitters who might be available out there. But, you know, the, I, I would be stunned if the Cardinals went out and traded for number one or two type, right? So the question is, if they're looking for number four types, who would that be? And is that better than the options that they have? You know, I like what Libertor can be. I like what he can be. I like the, what he showed in the last start when he was here. I like Palante. And, and to be quite honest with you, I, I know that it always seems like Cardinal fans want the Cardinals to go out and get these bigger names, and they're frustrated when they don't. But I think in this case with those two guys especially, those are pretty good options. you know. And I think the, the Cardinals are going to give them chances through the year to show what they can do. You know, and we still have a little ways until the, you know, not even until the All-Star game, but then until the trade deadline, I think, what's it, August 2nd this year? So right. it's a couple of days more. And I think they have some of the pieces there, if those guys are healthy, they don't need starting pitching as much this year as they have in some years past. I think adding to that bullpen might be a, a, a priority. You know, and it could be that if they find they – find a. Um, Sorry, my alarm just went off. But if they, right. if they find if they find that it's more palatable to go out and get a fifth starter, well, you know, not necessarily a fifth starter, but a guy to fit in that five man rotation, and then keep you know Palante in the bullpen, I think that could be an option too. So, you know, I think it's just about trying to find the value out there, and I know that's sometimes frustrating to Cardinals fans because it doesn't mean they're going out there and and flexing that might that they have with the system to bring in the bigger name pitchers, but I think, you know, they're, they're in a pretty good position right now. 
Um, how do you – what's your assessment of how the Albert Pujols edition is working out? It's been great. I think it's been everything they could have possibly asked for. You know, he's hitting 350 against lefties. He's showing some pop. He's showing I mean, He's got a couple home runs against right-handers. You know, I was looking at the stats a couple of days ago. He has as many walks as strikeouts against right-handers. Right, and I know the batting average is way down, but the on-base percentage against against righties is still around 280. And like I said, he's got as many walks as strikeouts against those guys. So he's showing that he can stand in there and not be completely anemic against right-handers. And I, I think that's what you want. You know, I think that he's been, um, you know, off the field too. He's been what you want. He's been what the Cardinals needed out of that position. Now, could they have gone out and you know paid a little bit more and and gotten somebody who's going to get uh you know 600 at bats out of the out of the position is is the best option they could have you know if we look back at the end of the season is Corey Dickerson and Albert Pujols the best DH combination there could have been you know I don't know but if we're just talking about Pujols I think he's been fantastic Ryan Fagan um I I don't know if you wanted to um I always I always localize this with you by talking about the Cardinals a lot and you're a national baseball writer but I do think that the Yankees are an incredible story. I think what Matt Carpenter's doing is pretty remarkable, and I think this is the third day in a row I've asked a national baseball writer or analyst to talk about Matt Carpenter and the Yankees. But that really, the record is just ridiculous, and what he's yeah. been able to do is certainly raises an eye, open some eyes. So what do you think about those two things? Well, I think clearly the Cardinals should be criticized pretty heavily for not making him go to a for not making him go to a mustache last year, right? I mean, I think you know the mustache that he's sporting with the, the Yankees is, is the key to his powers. It's kind of like his secret salsa this year. But you know, I mean, you know, Ken Rosenthal with the Athletic did a big story on, on the offseason about how Carpenter was reworking his swing, and you know, he put up decent numbers in the Rangers minor league organization, um, but didn't get the chance at the bigs, and so the Yankees took a chance on him, and he's been great. He's been really good. You know, he, he's, he's providing that power. You go, again, it's almost kind of like the, the pool situation for the Cardinals. He's done what they've asked of him. You know, he's hit the home runs. He's gotten some big knocks at big times. He's been a big part of that lineup because you look at that lineup, and, and even if Matt Carpenter is hitting home runs at the rate he is, you're still going to choose to pitch to him more often than not because of the other guys that are in that lineup. And I think that's, that's a big part of what he has been able to do over there. But, yeah, that's been one of the fun stories. I think when you look at the, the 2022 season so far has been the reemergence and the uh, renaissance of Matt Carpenter. Until next time, Ryan, uh, stay cool if you can, but really good talking to you again. <laughs> and uh, we'll always, keep re- reading you at the Sporting News. Always enjoy it, Bernie. Thanks for having me. All right. Thank you, buddy. That's our friend Ryan Fagan here on 590 The Fan. KFNS, Wav Andy Strickland coming up at the top of the hour. Uh, you know, Jim, I – I tell you what, man, I, I was talk, talking about this earlier um, and, and, you know, work, working on some stats and everything else, and I, uh, I can't stop writing about or talking about Brendan Donovan because it's just um, you're, you're sort of like, well, this really can't last. And I'm not saying it's going to last at the numbers that he puts up, but – this, like we've kind of joked a little bit, you know, this is not the sequel to the Bo Hart story either, you know? Right, not the scrappy guy, as we talked about the other night. Yeah, and I was looking at some stuff today, and, and you know, uh, and the reason I'm, like, almost speechless is because I'm a geek, and I get, and I really get almost, like, excited about some of this stuff. But you, but you the reason why... I think we've had some guests on the air, and I'm not knocking them. But I've picked up on a vibe uh, because I understand this, unless you follow the Cardinals closely as we do. I understand this. It's like me sort of, you know, off the top of my head or close to being top of my head, you know, commenting on, like, uh, why the, um, you know, why the Boston Red Sox, uh, you know, have been winning lately. And, like, I would have, like, I would nail every single reason unless you're unless you're covering uh, you're covering a team and analyzing team on a daily basis. And, and, and I'm pretty intense about that. Um, you're not really going to have a handle on it. I wouldn't expect people like from outside that this area, this sphere that we're in to, to really get it. But I've picked up on a vibe 
when I bring up Brennan Donovan, you, you sort of pick up on a vibe of like, oh, you know, it's yeah, oh yeah, he's doing he's doing really good, you know. <laughs> and then that's pretty. In, in yeah. other words, like, well, yeah, I, I guess it's a cute little story, but um, you know, I don't. I don't know what to say. You know, I, they don't say that, but I, I pick up on a vibe of like they don't really take it seriously or they don't really understand how fantastic this guy has been, you know? I agree. And so that's one of the reasons why I talk about it so much and because I want, I want at least all of us to appreciate it. And you know why I think he, his success is sustainable? It really comes down to a very, very simple thing. His, his knowledge of the strikes, his grasp of the strike zone, his overall plate discipline, and his contact skills. Now, that may not be the sexiest topic, but if, you, if, if you're scratching your head, you're enjoying it. Everybody's enjoying it. But if you're scratching your head and you're kind of saying, man, this is awesome, but what is it with this guy? He's hitting 341. He's got an on-base percentage near 450. Slugging 465. He's got an OPS nine, like 913. He's 66% above average offensively. What is it with this guy? Well, I always, I always, this sounds corny. I, I always kind of look at this. I, I have a, I have an obligation and a duty to try to explain what makes a guy go and why he's having success. And I enjoy it. And what I, I double my enjoyment by then looking at the reasons and, and compiling the reasons why this is a real thing rather than a fluke thing. His, his plate discipline and his contact rate and his patience at the plate, um, let me just throw a couple things. He leads all Cardinals regulars in all this stuff. He's got the lowest chase rate. He, he, he <laughs> swings at pitches out of the zone fewer times than – his teammates that play every day and he's the most selective hitter. He takes 40% of all the pitches thrown to him. He's got the highest contact rate on pitches in the strike zone. You know what that is? You throw him a strike and he swings. He, he connects 96% of the time. Wow. That's high. His overall contact rate leads the team. His swinging strike rate is only 5%. It's the lowest among Cardinals regulars. He's got the best walk rate on the team. His called strike rate is the second lowest on the team. Uh, he's third in Major League Baseball among guys that have 150 plate appearances more. Third with an average of 4.42 pitches per plate appearances. And this one freaks me out. One reason why he extends the so many at bats and gets the results because he wears the pitcher down in part and he's also just very smart he fouls off a lot of pitches and I kind of I kind of thought that that was the case but when I went to Bill James uh, the, the, the site I'm a subscriber I really enjoy some of the different stats that he and his team put out when Brandon, Brendan Donovan swings, right? He fouls off pitches at a rate of 46%. Um, no, no one on the Cardinals is even close to that. Now, try to absorb that. I ask all of us, all of you, try to absorb that for a minute. So you have a rookie, and you have a rookie that takes more pitches than anybody, who takes longer at bats than anybody on the team who swings and misses fewer, uh, f fewer times than anybody in the team, makes contact better than anybody on the team, on and on and on and on. And you say, well, and he draws all these walks. But he keeps these bats alive. It bats alive by fouling off pitch after pitch after pitch after pitch. So you, I guess we can get mad at him because he's lengthening the time of games. But... <laughs> but I know this sounds weird, but I, I think it takes a really special skill to be able to foul off that many pitches instead of just succumbing, you know, just getting a piece of it, staying alive, keeping yourself, keeping yourself in the batter's box instead of walking back to the dugout. That's, that is a skill in itself. You know, I really believe that, you know. 
So when you have this kind of plate approach and you're capable of doing these little things like that, well, why wouldn't your success last? I mean, is he suddenly going to go start swinging at everything and, you know, losing his discipline, t- sort of taking the, a dumb approach instead of this highly refined approach? I mean, this is pretty special stuff we're seeing here. He is not afraid to go the other way, which is something right. that is like a lost art. It really is a lost art with n- younger players. It's like I got to pull the ball. I got to. The only way I'm getting up here is by show the power. And oh, by the way, if you look at his numbers right now, he's third on the team in doubles. He hasn't yeah. been here all year. He's third yeah. on the team in doubles. And you and I have talked about this. We love doubles. Doubles are just as good as home runs. He doesn't have to hit the ball out of the park to be effective. He is just in the middle of everything. Like every time he comes up at the plate, like you said, Bernie, he is disciplined you know he's going to get a, a, a good at bat he's going to get looks at the plate and most pitchers these days especially like when you're facing the pirates if, if they have to go five pitches deep in a bat you're going to beat them they just don't have enough in their arsenal to beat somebody that that's with most pitchers i'm not talking about the scherzers of the world i'm talking about the guys who are just guys who are just making it in the league those guys can't win that way as pitchers, they got to put you away quickly and get move on, because they just don't have that many great pitches. Yeah, I mean, you're when you're averaging nearly four and a half pitches seen per plate appearances, and and just wait till the, I almost called it the shot clock. I guess it is. Just wait till the pitch clock goes into effect. Oh boy, yeah. You know, these guys are going to be huffing and puffing. He's going to be fouling pitches off, fouling pitches off, fouling pitches off. You know, and we look at Cardinals, who I think take really good at bats, but I I mentioned you know that the that he's fouling, fouling balls off like 46% of his swings or a foul ball. That's yeah. just a ridiculous number. And I said, well, I'm going to look up other Cardinals. And, you know, for example, Goldie fouls off 36%. Edmonds, same. You know, but most of these guys are in the 30s. Albert Pujols has done it 42%. That's the only guy close. But he he doesn't take as many at-bats. He's not in the lineup every day. So, but, yeah, you know, I looked around at some other players, and I'm not going to go through all the players, but, you know, it's if you're in the 30s, you know, you're fouling off like maybe one out of every three pitches. If you watch games, that sounds about right or whatever. But this guy's fouling off, uh, you know, 46% of all the when he swings. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's just a ridiculous number. And, by the way, to your point about what he's done since he's joined the team, I looked at that earlier today, too. His first, uh, his first game in the Cardinals is April 25th. So from that date through last night, in other words, let's pretend the season started on April the 25th. Yep. Um, he ranked second to Goldie in batting average on base percentage, slugging percentage, OPS, and doubles. He's third in RBI, and he's fourth in run scored. So if the season started when he started um, – He's basically the second best hitter on the team. Now, some people say, well, what are you talking about? Arenado this, Arenado that. Look, they're different type of hitters. And by the way, Arenado only st- Arenado's strikeout rate is unbelievable. It's only like 5 five and a half percent or something. Arenado's good. Well, I didn't realize it was that low this year. That's go, go take a look at it. It's crazy. Arenado's good. But, but again, his value is delivered in other ways. Like, but... When you're second to Goldschmidt, who we know is the best hitter on the team, but you're second to him, batting average, pretty important category, on-base percentage, really important category, slugging percentage, that's impressive considering he's only got one home run, but as Jim Hewer pointed out, double, 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 double. Oh, amazing. He's got the second best OPS to Goldie. So – why wouldn't we just say, yeah, he at least up to this point since he came to this team, yeah, it could change, but he's probably second best hitter on the team. I agreed. I he is uh, as far as he and uh, Goldschmidt when they come up, I stop everything I'm doing just to make sure I see their at bat because they're quality at bats. I love watching you know the game within the game of how the pitcher's trying to attack him, and right now. Donovan is like, well, you can attack me any way you want. I'm going to get on base because I'm going to put the ball in play where you pitch it, and I'm going to beat you. And he's done it time and time again. There's, yeah, in, in time he's going to. You can't keep that 46 percent up like you just said. 
of of contact rate, but still that he's going to be a guy who's going to con- hit get Foul contact. Yep, and yeah. and make things happen. So, um, yeah, the, the, some of these stats are level off, but if you maintain this kind of plate discipline and contact skill, you're going to have a really good season. One other thing on this, and I know we're getting up on a break, but I just want to close this out. Mm-hmm. You know, I was looking at Baseball Reference version of wins above replacement. And he's going to be in a disadvantage because he didn't play his first game since till April 25th. So you, you accumulate, you know, war by the more you play it, as long as you're doing well. I mean, you, the more you accumulate war. So to, to look at this and say, well, he has 1.8 war and that's like down like maybe 40th in baseball. What's so special about that? Well, it is special because, again, he got off to a late start. He doesn't have the at bats, the number of at bats of the guys that are, are the leaders in this category. Like, in some cases, he's got 100 fewer at-bats. So, of course, he's not going to have the same wins above replacement. But here's what I can tell you about it. Uh, his, his war for the baseball reference version, 1.8, it's the exact same as Pete Alonzo, Tim Anderson, and Carlos Correa. <laughs> and it is better than uh, Francisco Lindor, Trevor Story, Corey Seager, Marcus Simeon, uh, all you know, all those guys that a lot Cardinals, of money there. Cardinals fans wanted to, you know, build the wit to spend a billion dollars on or whatever. You know, um, he's got a higher WAR than uh, Freddie Freeman, uh, Jose Altuve, uh, J.T. Real Muto, Wander Franco, John Carlos Stanton, Kyle Schwarber, Matt Olson, Randy Rosarina, Christian Yelich, Ozzy Albies, Jack Peterson, Anthony Rizzo, on and on and on and on. And that's after getting a late start in the season, not being promoted until April 25th. This guy's one hell of a player, man. I'll just leave it at that and shut up now, and we'll take a break. (laughs) 